it's interesting. I'm going to just capitalize on a couple of things. Uh, but before I do that, I just I want to ask my wife to come and just greet you. She doesn't share a lot, but yeah, just come. And greet Hello, everyone. Pastor Joel, it's been just an honor. You guys, can you give it up for your pastor one more time? Like, he's just the real deal himself. Um, and I love standing on the platform next to this guy. It's such an honor. Um, not only do we represent diversity in our marriage, um, we represent diversity in the kingdom. And we really believe that that's part of our ministry. Not necessarily like racial reconciliation necessarily, but unity in the body. Not, we don't necessarily, like, like we don't want to go down that path necessarily, um, but we have a passion to activate anybody, everybody in their faith, to awaken, arise, and activate you in your faith and even those who are dead to Christ. Um, and so I just want to encourage you, last night's message, keep digging in. That's what's going on in my life. Last night he shared how 2019 was just a crazy year for us. Um, two miscarriages, a relocation to a completely different culture from Oklahoma up to Minnesota, and then his father passing away in November. It was just a whew, whirlwind of a year, but I said, I'm never going back. Where would I go except to the feet of Jesus? I feel like I clung to him in those moments and I wept on the floor and we wept together and just continued to do life, but we didn't let go of Christ. I said, this is an opportunity for me to live out my faith. Regardless of what's happened in my life, I really am able to live the principles of faith to faith and glory to glory. And so if you're going through something difficult, just cling to the cross, cling to your Bible, stick it out and continue to be a witness to those who are around you that what you're going through is a tool the Lord is using to refine you and to be a witness to others who are going through the same thing or will go through the, through the same thing in the future. So cling to the cross uh, blessings to you. We look forward to coming back <laughs> and just spending time with you even more. So thank you so much. Thank you, honey. Uh, <clears throat> so <clears throat> I'm super excited. I have to like reserve myself uh, right now because I'm like so excited to get to this message because this is just a part of my life that I love uh, of what I'm going to share with you tonight. And I really feel like uh, God just put it on my heart in the body for the body. Uh, of Christ, and so whenever I feel the prompting to share this particular message and craft it to where he may know you all would be, I listen very attentively, but uh, I just want to capitalize on something Pastor Joel said uh, about the, the assemblies. It's a great organization, and we're privileged to be a part of it. This church is a part of it, and uh, when I originally came in, I came out of the Church of God in Christ, and uh, it was a, a great organization. It's the largest Christian organization in the USA. Um, it's over 6 million adherents, and God had called me. I grew up in that and got a lot of foundation, but God had called me to the assemblies when I went into ministry, and I didn't even know who the assemblies was, um, and it was just a crazy story. I won't go into detail, but uh, in regards to what Pastor Joe was saying about missionaries, most of you have been maybe in the AG or come from a church in the AG, and Illinois has a very rich di district of the assemblies of God. I love Pastor Phil Schneider, who's the superintendent, and so many others, Pastor Ron Heitman and just other great leaders, including your pastor as one of the presbyters. And so um, one of those things that I noticed in the assemblies early on is that there was always a strong missions push to see the world reach for the gospel. But there was always this lacking push of the diversity in that. And so lately over the past few years, the assemblies has actually grown to over 42 percent non-white. But today, out of the 2,800 missionaries, only nine are considered black, right? That's a problem. And our leadership recognizes that, too. And so I was just asked and called by God to help lead this initiative. And I tell you, every day I tell God, I don't know what the heck I'm doing. Uh, help me, Jesus. And so uh, that we're super excited. We've been taking people to different places around the world, black individuals in particular, the Latin Americans have really made a dent in the Assemblies of God. They're, they've been growing. Uh, they're about 20 to 25 percent of the fellowship as a whole of just that diversity that has happened. And so 
uh, we're super excited because, let me just give you a quick, this wasn't even part of my message, but I feel the prompting. Can I share this really quick, Pastor? Awesome. Um, what happened in the mid-19, in the 1900s is the Assemblies of God, uh, because of segregation laws, they, we, they made a choice to not really follow the biblical presupposition of the Bible and go with culture. So what happened was there were several blacks that had the opportunity to be ordained, was approved by certain districts, one being Northern California, Nevada, but the general council denied that because of the segregation issues that was happening. Um, and in history, we have some things that we've repented over as a fellowship, and that's great. But now it's like, how is action going to be put to that, right? And so it's one of those things where we love our brothers and sisters. There's no black, there's no white, obviously, in Jesus' eyes. But we cannot take away the, ethno, the, ethnic, the ethnicity of who we are. That's, that's who Jesus called us to be. If you're white, if you're black, if you're Hispanic, if you're Asian, that's who we are. And so there is no, we can't just say, oh, well, there's no black or white in the kingdom. That's a lie. It is. Every tribe, every nation, every tongue, right? And so that's really important that we have to get that. And, and what's happening right now in our movement is so great. We're super excited is that we're recognizing that when the segregation happened, blacks were essentially cut off from going to the mission field. That's exactly what happened. And so what happened was they began to go into the inner cities. And that's where they began to focus most of their work but then it prevented them from having this worldview of going across cultural barriers. And so now we're literally having to desensitize some of our pastors to say it's not just your Jerusalem. It's Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so with that being said, that's an initiative that we're leading. But I want to invite you guys to pray for us on a couple of points. And I've got a slide that I just want to show you really quick. Pastor Joe gave me the permission. Do we have that? If we do, we're good to pull that up. Uh, there's a slide on prayer, and if you don't find it, we can pull it up at, toward the end of the service. But uh, one of the things that we're recognizing as a ministry is uh, we need prayer. I, I don't say that lightly. Um, we really need prayer. And so uh, one of the things that we're doing this year as an organization is creating more partner churches to join us in prayer. Not just join us in prayer, but even maybe join us on mission in several ways. And so uh, there is a, a, a prayer text tool that um, I'll, help, I'll help my brothers find it here in a moment as they're working on it. But if you would say, man, God, I want to pray for that initiative and join Will in our fellowship in praying. And not only that, just our ministry AMI. Uh, man, we're going into some really tough areas, and I don't want to tell you how tough they are because some of you might want to go, but if I tell you how tough they are, you might not want to go. And so, but we're going to just places like, for example, Sierra Leone this year, 70% Muslim. Uh, it's a peaceful country. The Muslims and Christians work together, but it's, it's unreached. There's 14 unreached people groups, over a million and a half people. And so we're doing a national project in Sierra Leone this year, and we just need prayer, my friends. We need prayer. We, we believe as a ministry we pray every Tuesday. We fast every Wednesday. I mean, we pray and we trust God that whenever we pray, he's moving and working in areas that we don't see. And so we want to invite you all to pray with us. And uh, when, whenever they get that, I'll do it maybe at the end of service. Pastor, can you remind me, if you remember, uh, to help us get that? But it's just a prayer tool. As a matter of fact, let me just help you do it right now. Whoever has a smartphone, lift your hands. Great, great, great. If you have a dumb phone, lift your hand. That means it just flips open. I love it because it can work on that too. Uh, if you have a smartphone and you're like, man, Will, I'm going to join you guys in prayer. Just take out your phone right now, and I'm going to just walk you through this quick thing. You can text the number. As a new text, 76959. I'll say that again, 76959. And then the words that you're going to text is pray, P-R-A-Y, 2020. No spaces at all, just pray 2020. It's not case sensitive either. Once you push that send, you'll get a, a, a response back. So what you have to do once you get the response back is there's a click, a, a link. And there's about four to five questions on that link just to make sure that we figure out how to best contact you. Now, I want to let you know this disclaimer. We're not going to be sending you emails and text messages every day of the week. I promise you that because I don't have time to manage all that with our team. 
But we will keep you updated about twice a month on a text. So, for example, when I'm headed to Saudi Arabia next month, I'm going to text you and say, hey, I'm headed to Saudi Arabia. You might see a picture of me on the plane or with a Muslim brother and say, pray for me. Um, you'll get that text. You might get an email that says, hey, our team's going here. Pray for us. We've got a conference or something. And so if you fill out that form, we'll be able to get your information. That way we can send you text updates. We call a lot of times to say, hey, how can we be praying for you? And so it's a really mutual act, partnership. And so if you fill out that form in, in its entirety, then we'll have your info. What I don't want you to do is stop when you see the form because then we, we can't contact you. So just text PRAY2020 to 76959 and then we'll be in touch with you as our team. And thank you for those of you who are signing up. This I'm serious, you all. This means the world to us because we understand as a ministry that it's the power of prayer that gets us through. There were several years ago when I was in Nigeria and I called my wife. I didn't want to tell her. I said, I don't, I don't feel like I'm coming home. Spiritual warfare was that strong. They had security with me everywhere. They texted our, our host, where's Will Jones? He's supposed to be here. He's there. He's there. He's here. They knew everywhere I was. And I just felt the, the, the spiritual battle so strong. And I told my wife, I said, send out a mass email to everybody. Pray. Because I need the devil to be cast down. And I'm telling you, it was probably about 12 hours then I felt something lift. It was powerful. And then there was breakthrough on the ground when we were ministering. It was crazy. So prayer really matters, my friend. And so that's why I'm so excited tonight to talk about this aspect of living under the influence. You, you, you all ready for tonight? Man, I'm telling you, this is going to be awesome. I'm going to try to preach really quick. And so I know we have the, the, uh, the interpreters back there. I'm praying right now, Father, in Jesus' name, that you would help them to be able to interpret as fast as I could talk. <laughs> I know my sister's laughing with me back there, but I pray for them tonight. But I want to really, I want to go over some practical things with us, and then I want to create the most of our time tonight to be spent in prayer. That might scare some of you. Um, this is why. Because the church today we sometimes approach prayer as almost as if it's like a continental breakfast. So when I'm traveling a lot, we're in the Marriott and points and all that stuff, and I can and I gotta go and somebody's picking me up to speak or something. I'm grabbing my stuff in the morning, I got a meeting, I'm grabbing my stuff and I gotta go. And sometimes that's how we can treat God in our relationship with Him. We gotta move, we gotta go, we gotta get to work, gotta get the kids, we gotta do this. And it's like Tonight, I want us to create this environment where there is no, there's no time limits. There really isn't. Let's just, let's really soak. And so we started that journey last night, but I'm super thrilled about tonight because I'm talking about living under the influence of the Holy Spirit. That's what we're talking about. And as believers, church, uh, not even potentially believers, but uh, uh, as a church that believes in the power of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, God wants us to function under the influence of who he is. He wants us to operate under the unction and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so, as I mentioned to you, even on Sunday, if you attended the services this week or this weekend, the Holy Spirit, he's, he's with us every day. Every day. He's called the parakolitos, which is the one who walks alongside. And so, when you get up in the morning, he's with you. When you go to bed at night, he's with you. When you're driving to work, he's with you. When you're having a meeting with your boss or your colleague or someone you're managing or with your schoolmate, he's with you. Every day, the Holy Spirit is with us as believers, but it's rare that we recognize he's with us. And I want to help you to leave tonight knowing, man, the Holy Spirit, he's with me. He lives with me. He's, I can talk to him. I can listen to him. He's not an it. He is a he. And so he's a personality. We can grieve him. He has emotions. Like, he is God. And so I want you to walk away with this encounter tonight of, of growing deeper in the Holy Spirit and who he is. So that, man, when you live your day-to-day -day life, Pastor Joe says this often, we, he, he wants you to live on mission. And in order to live on mission, man, you need the influence of the Holy Spirit in your life. And so today, I want us to talk about the living under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And again, I have, I have my beer over here. Come on, somebody. I got my beer over here. Some of you were really excited. 
you were like, oh, I'm at the right church in Jesus' name. It is root beer, by the way. But uh, I remember growing up, I'm going to share a couple stories kind of in the beginning. I remember growing up, and I had a friend, and we called him Chucky. Chucky was a short, stocky little point guard, man. I mean, he would bag you down the post up. And I'm like, how does this little five, seven dude posting people up? I mean, Chucky was great. He was one of my best friends. And we always spent the night over Chucky's house. And Chucky had this uncle that he just became an uncle to me. In the black culture, everybody becomes family. And, uh, uh, miss, miss so-and-so down the street is your auntie, grandmama next door. I mean, anybody can whoop you in the black culture. Anybody. It's not child abuse because you're going to get a whooping from her, and then you're going to go home and get a whooping. And that's just the black culture, right? And so uh, I remember Uncle Jimmy. We called him Jimmy Ike. And Jimmy Ike was an alcoholic. Oh, he stayed drunk. Every time you saw Jimmy Ike, he was drunk. And, you know, it, it was interesting because you could smell Jimmy coming. The, 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 any liquor he would drink, it just came out of his pores. And you can go over there in the daytime, and Jimmy was drunk. You can go in the nighttime, and Jimmy was drunk. And he had about a small window where he slept maybe about three to four hours a day. And then I think he was even drunk while he was asleep. And so when we would get around Jimmy, it was funny because Jimmy would always preach. And I'm like, I know he was called to be a preacher. He would preach drunk. He would quote the Bible, and he would... Preach. Anybody of you got some family like that? They just, they full of the devil, but they know the Bible. And he would just preach and preach, and you need to get right with God, and all these things. And I'm like, Jimmy, you smell like a six-pack of Budweiser mixed with Hennessy and Heineken. Like, what are you talking about? But Jimmy stayed under the influence of, the, of, of liquor. And, and I, I was thinking about this message, and again, when, when we would be around him, he would just reek. Like alcohol. And I, and I said to myself, man, God, I would love to live under the influence of the Holy Spirit like that. I mean, just, if I just start downing these root beer or somebody, don't you know a sugar high is coming? Some of you parents know what I'm talking about. Give your kids some candy after 9 o'clock. You're going to have trouble getting them to bed. But I would just start downing these root beers, man. I'd be preaching to you, and eventually I'd be burping, and eventually I'd be running around on sugar high because I'm under the influence of this IBC, this root beer. But what would happen if we as the church lived that way, wanting to live under the influence of the Holy Spirit, spending time in the Word, in prayer, in our Bible, sharing our faith with people? To, it got to a point where the disciples was when they were in the Sanhedrin court and being charged, these men of the Jewish council said, these men are different. I perceive they've been with Jesus. They, 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 they've been with him. And to the disciples, that was a compliment. They were like, yes, we, we're identifying with our Lord and Savior. And I, I believe Jesus wants that for his church. I believe when, when people see us, they're like, man, there's something different about them. They have something on them that I can't deal with or I can't handle or I can't fathom. And it's something and it's this attraction of the Holy Spirit that's drawing them. Have you ever been around somebody that when you were present with them, they just felt convicted? I had some friends like that. They would always say, man, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to curse. And I, this is what I finally told them. If you got that much reverence for me, why don't you have that much reverence for God? But it was, I, I, I was so thankful because in those seasons, it was like God was using me to, to really portray who he was to them. And, and one of my friends, he responded. He said, man, you're so right. And I was able to share the gospel with him, and he didn't get saved, but I was sowing the seed in his heart. And it was just the influence of the Holy Spirit that was around me that was drawing him to have such reverence because he recognized it wasn't just me. It was God working through me and that I was different than who he was. And my friends, I believe God wants us to be living under such influence of the Holy Spirit. And this is interesting about influence. The truth of the matter is that we all will live under some type of influence. Either the influence of the Holy Spirit or we'll live under the influence of the world. 
And that's why I love seasons of fasting and prayer. And let me encourage you, church, don't just let it be in January. Make it a part of your life. And this is why, because Jesus told the disciples something so key one day, and I had a message on this called Powerless Disciples. Because it's, it's plaguing me as the church because we, we say we're a Pentecostal, we're spirit-filled, but man, people don't see the power demonstrated in our lives. And why is that? Well, Jesus gives us an answer in one of his stories in the gospel. He goes to the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John, and he comes back, but the other disciples are down off the mountain, and they're still doing some ministry. And there was one man whose son, uh, he was a demoniac, and he brought his son to the disciples, and he said, man, they couldn't heal him. They couldn't cast the demon out. This is talking about the power of prayer and fasting here, church. And Jesus said to him, bring the boy to me. So how, you knuckleheads, how long am I going to deal with you? How long am I going to put up with you, you perverse and you crooked generation? Let me tell you what he, what he meant. He says, you unbelieving and you perverse generation. This is what Jesus was saying. You're unbelieving because you've been disconnected with God. And you're perverse and you're crooked because you are too connected to the world. That's what he was saying. And so this kind only comes out by fasting and prayer. It wasn't that this power was going to just necessarily come upon you because you passed it and prayed. No, 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 no. What he was saying is when you pray, you reconnect yourself back to God. And when you fast, you disconnect yourself from the world. This is exactly what he was trying to communicate to us. And so this season, as we prayed and fasted, remember, you feel so much spiritual sensitivity in your life versus you did at the end of last year, don't you? You, you, you feel like you're hearing the Holy Spirit more clearly. You feel like you're reading the Bible and you're getting some things out of it a little bit more in detail. That's because you spent time disconnecting from the world and reconnecting back to God. And he wants us to be like that every single day. And obviously there are seasons when things begin to happen and you begin to get influenced and you spend too much time on social media and Facebook and IGTV and Instagram and Pinterest and recipes and taking the kids out and you forget your prayer time and your devotion. That happens to the best of us. But we got to remember that if we're going to function under the truth of the, of the word of God and the spirit's power, we've got to stay connected to God and be disconnected from the world. Now, what I mean by that is not associating with the world. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying to remove yourself and create this bubble from the world. No, 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 no. What I'm saying is don't be intertwined with the things of the world as First John told us. Love not the world nor the things in it. And so what I'm trying to help you understand is the Holy Spirit wants to influence us, but we'll either be influenced by him or we'll be influenced by things in the world. Influence is such a powerful thing, and we can either affect others with our influence in a good way or a bad way, or we will be affected by the influence of people in other things. You know, I'll say it to you this way, church. Whoever and whatever you spend time with the most is what influences you. Whoever and whatever you spend time with the most will always influence you. And so some of us, we're here today, and if we could truly be honest with ourselves, man, we may be influenced by an unhealthy relationship. We could be holding on to it. We could be in one that's not healthy, and God's telling us to get out of it. I'm not talking about those of you that are married. There's no excuse to get out. Push through. Come on, in Jesus' name. You might come on, somebody. People are like, oh, the preacher said I can. No, 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 no. I ain't what I said. Uh-uh. Uh uh. Check this out. We may be influenced by hurt and unforgiveness. We may be influenced by the wrong friends, our friends that are not operating in Christ the way we are trying to. We may be influenced by our friends. We may be influenced by identity issues or materialism or success or our pathway to reach a certain thing with ambition to succeed. We can find ourselves influenced by so many things. Things that I want to let you know tonight, ladies and gentlemen, that the Holy Spirit wants you to be influenced by him and only him. God's word, God's thoughts, his presence, his power. That's what the Holy Spirit wants for our lives, church. That's what the Holy Spirit wants for our lives. And so tonight, as we kind of dive into this, I want us to kind of look at the life of Peter, the apostle. Peter, the apostle. 
You know, God has a purpose for us. He has a plan for us and only happens as followers of Jesus when we're really living under the power of the Holy Spirit and his influence. That's really how God's plan and purpose happens in our life. When we can get the direction from the Holy Spirit, direction from God's word, and we get the faith based on what he said and stand on his substance of who he is and what he said and begin to move forward, trusting the Holy Spirit, that's when we're living under his influence. That's when the kingdom of God can begin to be expanded. And so I want to look at the life of Peter tonight because Peter was an interesting individual. If you don't know Peter, uh, you can find a little bit of story in John chapter 1. He has his brother named Andrew who goes and finds Peter and brings him to meet Jesus. And Jesus has this great prophetic word, meaning he, he had some insight and foresight into Peter's life. And he looked at Peter and said, thou art Peter. He called him the rock. He called him this, he called him what he would become, not who he was. Oh, that's what I love about Jesus. Some of you are in a place of who you are, and you think that that's all who you'll be. But I want to let you know when Jesus talks to you, he doesn't speak to you about who you are. Only he speaks to you about who he wants you to be. And so Jesus uh, he speaks to Peter and gives him this great word, and Peter becomes one of his disciples. But I just want to tell you a little bit about Peter. Peter was what I like to call, in East St. Louis, we called him a goon. He was a person, man, that had tattoos, the earrings, carried the nine in his back, and I mean, or a sword on his side. And Peter would, he would bust you up in a minute if you messed with Peter. Or if you messed with one of his boys, he was a goon. You just didn't want to mess with Peter. You know Peter. You've heard of him before if you haven't. Listen, it was in the Gospels when Jesus was getting ready to be taken to this place to be arrested and crucified that when Jesus was arrested, Peter pulled out his sword and cut off the ear of the high priest's servant. He was a goon, but he was also a knucklehead because he even tried to rebuke Jesus one day when Jesus was getting ready to go. And Jesus said, get behind these Satan. He called Peter Satan at that moment. He said, your, your plans are, for, are not for the kingdom. You're thinking about yourself. And, and Peter was the same Peter that was like, Jesus, I'm with you. I got your back. Ride or die, bro. I'm with you. And then when the rooster began to crow and the heat, and the heat got pulled up, Peter was like, I don't know that dude, man. What y'all talking about? I don't know him. I don't know him. And then he really solidified it because he got to cursing. Whatever he said in Hebrew or whatever his language was, I don't know him. Leave me alone. But I love this because we see this Peter in the Bible, and he's hard, he's tough, and Jesus tells him, man, you're going to deny me. I love you, but it's going to happen. And Peter's like, no, no, no. And then trouble comes, and he does exactly what Jesus does. I says, and the next chapter of Peter's life, we see them really in this agony because Jesus has been killed. Everything that they've been told by him, that they've been spoken of by him, that they've seen by him, they're wondering, church, man, is this guy really a fluke? Is he real? Like, how? this doesn't make sense. Why is he gone? And then three days later, they get a message from the women. It says, hey, Jesus is off the grave. And Peter just takes off running. And he's out of breath. <sighs> he had to kneel and just wait. And then he finally got to the tomb. And he's like, whoa, wait a minute. Where is he? And he remembered, oh, snap. He said, meet him in Galilee. And so he goes there and he sees Jesus and Jesus spends literally 40 days with his disciples post-resurrection. And he spends this with them talking about his kingdom to help them understand the mission and the power that they need for the mission. What I mean by power, the influence of the Holy Spirit's power that they're going to need for the mission. And so Peter... It was a he was he was a fisherman, he was a goon, he was a liar, he was a thief. I mean, he was all the above. And God used Peter. What does that mean for you? You might have all kind of issues, insecurity, been molested before, been abused, been misused, been downtrodden, all the things you want to think of. But guess what? God still can use you. The Bible's full of those people. 
And so we see here in the book of Acts, and that's what we're going to kind of camp out tonight, church. We see here something happens to Peter. After Jesus is, res- is, is ascended in Acts 1, he, he's like, hey, guys, I've told you about this. I've got to go back because if I don't go back, the Holy Spirit, he can't come. So what he told him in the book of John, chapter 16, 14, 15, and 16, he told him, I'm not going to leave you as orphans when I leave. I'm going to send you a comforter who will be with you. He'll walk alongside of you. He'll live in you. He'll be up on you. And even when you get in trouble and you feel like you don't know what to say, he'll be the one speaking through you. And this is why I love the Holy Spirit. I get excited about the Holy Spirit because he, he is the very presence of God that Jesus sent back to help us carry out the mission. And what the enemy has tried to do is quiet the church by helping us not talk about the Holy Spirit. We say, oh, that church is weird. They are tongue talkers, healing prayers, and all that stuff. No, 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 no. It's not that the Holy Spirit is weird. People are weird. It's what it is. We make him weird. He's not weird. And so Peter, on the day of Pentecost, we see something happen to Peter. This same Peter we talked about with all these issues that that didn't really want to speak up and be bold for Jesus when it was time to be bold. He he became this coward in, in essence. And then a few days later, about 40 days later, 50 days later, on the day of Pentecost, what happens is the Holy Spirit comes upon Peter and 120 people. And I want you to see Peter's life after the Holy Spirit comes on him. He becomes bold. He becomes this man of authority that he remembered that Jesus had gave to him. And not only Peter, but the rest of the people that he would lead as the church. And so tonight as we talk about living under the influence of the Holy Spirit, I want us to to, to see a couple of things. Number one, I want to just camp out here. Because I don't want to assume that everyone in this place, in this particular time, has received the filling or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to talk about that really quickly. The first thing that we need to think about when we want to live under the influence of the Holy Spirit is to spend time seeking the Holy Spirit. Let's just go to Acts. Let's read a little bit in Acts. Let's start in Luke, though. Luke, because Luke and Acts were actually one book, and we kind of divided it, but it it actually is is a sequel Acts is kind of the sequel to Luke, and it just continues over. Let's read in Luke really quick, the last chapter, verse 48 and 49. So this was Luke's uh, example of Jesus' resurrection. And Jesus comes back from the dead, and and then he's talking to them, and he says, I'm going to just pick up in verse 46. He says, then he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for Christ to suffer, die, and rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise. Everybody say promise. He says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. So this is what Jesus was telling them right now. He says, hey, I'm getting ready to go back to be with Daddy. Before, when I go, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, who's the promise of the Father. Wait on him. Tarry is what they, they meant, to wait. He says, wait on the Holy Spirit back in these days. And he'll endue you with power. He said, don't go on mission before he comes. Now, I want to remind you, they had no clue what he would look like. They had no clue who he was. They didn't know if he was a person. They didn't know. They are just like, okay. And so Jesus tells them, wait until you receive the promise of my father and wait into Jerusalem. And then when he comes, you are going to be endued with power from on high. Influence from on high. So let's go over to Acts. Let's go over to Acts really quickly. Acts 1a. This is what Jesus, he's getting ready to be ascended. And he's getting ready to go back to be with the Father. And he's getting ready to send the Holy Spirit to the church. And I really want us to get this, church, because we, we I think sometimes we've had this misnomer of who the Holy Spirit is and his purpose. And I want you to understand this tonight. In Acts 1-8, this is Jesus talking right before he's getting ready to go back to be with the Father. He says this, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come up on you. And you shall be witnesses. 
to meet in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Let me see something. He said power and witness. Power and witness. He didn't say that we're going to see power to speak in tongues. No, 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 no. He said we're going to see power to be witnesses. That in our witnessing, basically testifying of who he is, a witness means when you walk in the courtroom, what do they say? Do you testify to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? What are they asking of you? They're asking you to testify, be a witness of all that you have seen and or heard. And so what Jesus is saying, I'm going to give you the power to testify all that you have seen and or heard about me as you proclaim me. That's what he was saying. So the Holy Spirit was sent to the church so that we can be witnesses of Christ. And as we proclaim Jesus, this is what I love about the Holy Spirit. It's all throughout the book of Acts, church. As we proclaim Jesus, the Holy Spirit shows up and he begins to do things as if Jesus is actually there. He does. One day I was in Africa and, and I was preaching, Jesus will heal you. Jesus loves you. Jesus, I mean, I'm sweating, spitting, everything. I mean, I'm just, I'm going crazy. Jesus. And at the end of the service, at the end of not the service, but the festival that we had, uh, we pray for the sick. It was masses of people out there, thousands. And there was this man, and he couldn't walk. He was, and, and the lady had him by the hand and, he gave his life to Jesus that day, and they were there preaching. I'm preaching, and the man raises his hand for healing. And I'm like, place your hand over any area of your body that you need healing. So he places his hand over his eyes, and I'm like, okay, he's blind. And so I'm praying, in the name of Jesus, and they're interpreting, da, 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 da. in the name of Jesus, I command healing. I'm praying out of my heart with the authority of Jesus. And then I heard one lady, she started screaming, ah! And I'm like, okay, that's a demon. Great. And this one guy, I noticed him, and I said, bring him to the platform. So they brought him up, and I asked his neighbor who brought him. She said, he's legally blind. I said, really? So I, I'm praying for him on that platform. I wish I had showed you this picture, but this is a Holy Spirit moment. And I'm praying for him, and as I grab his eyes, I feel the burden of his blindness, and I just begin to weep, and I said, Jesus, in your name, his eyes be open now. I stepped back. I said, what do you see? He like this. The guy interpreted. He said, nothing. I said, oh, my gosh. I grabbed him again because Jesus spit in the mud. He spit in the mud. He prayed again. He told the man, I see trees. What do you see? I said, let me pray again. I prayed again. In the name of Jesus. And I'm thinking my loudness is going to do something. But I was just feeling under the unction of the Holy Spirit. I prayed for the guy. And I stepped back. I said, what do you see? He said, nothing. At this moment, the enemy is like, yeah, you're about to get stoned, buddy. You're preaching this Jesus. He's not healing anybody. And I'm having this doubt in my mind. And I say to Jesus in my spirit, man, I said, Jesus, I know your word. I'm not going to quit. I'm going to have faith until his eyes will be open. And this is what Jesus says. You have preached me. Let me heal him. The third time, church, I pray in the name of Jesus. I commend your eyes to be open. The man started doing like this. I said, what do you see? How many fingers? He said, one. I, I stepped to the back of the platform. What do you see? How many fingers? He said, two. The crowd erupted. This man was immediately healed of blind eyes. His eyes open. His eyes open. His eyes open. So what am I saying to you today? It wasn't Will who healed him. It was Jesus who healed him. And I chose to operate under the authority and the influence of the Holy Spirit, exercising the right that Jesus gave me as a disciple. And so I want to talk to us just about seeking the Holy Spirit because there are some of you that are here tonight and you have never received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. What I mean by that, this term is synonymous. You have baptism and filling of the Holy Spirit. So when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, 
First, we're baptized with Christ into the body of Christ when you get saved. And then we get baptized into the Holy Spirit, and then we get baptized in water. So it's like three baptisms. It can be confusing, but I'll leave that on Pastor Joe to teach you. Uh, <laughs> he's like, oh, Will, you're not coming back. <laughs> but the baptism in the Holy Spirit is specifically what Jesus said here. He said, and not many days afterward, you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So what he was meaning is, I'm going to fulfill the promise of the Father, and I'm going to send the Holy Spirit so that you would have power from on high to live out the mission. And so in Acts 2 and 4, what happens is they're praying in the upper room, and that's why prayer is so important tonight, because they're praying, and they're seeking God, and they're praying to Jesus, and Jesus actually begins to baptize them in the Holy Spirit. And what happens is they all begin to speak in this new language. And this language was a language that they could not articulate of their own intellect. This language was a language that was from the Spirit because he said the Spirit gave them the utterance, which means the ability to speak. And this language is so key because it's not just for prayer and praise, but this language is also for proclamation. So when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, he gives you the boldness that's outside of your control. The power that Jesus talks about is dunamis. It's where we get the word dynamite from. And so this is a power that Peter began to experience on the day of Pentecost. He stood up with this new power, and he preached to over 3,000 people one day with no microphone, no Bible, and 3,000 people gave their life to Jesus. The reason why he could do that is because, one, he was proclaiming Jesus. Two, he was living under the power and the influence of the Holy Spirit. And so some of you tonight, you're going to encounter who the Holy Spirit is for the first time, and you'll receive this promise that he, Jesus talked about years ago, and is he is the Holy Spirit. And you'll begin to pray in this new language. And the language is not what we're seeking after. No, 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 no. We're seeking after the power to live a life of boldness and godliness for Jesus through the Holy Spirit. That's what we're seeking after. And so some of you tonight, I want you to take that step. If you've never received the Holy Spirit baptism, then I need you to be honest with yourself and Jesus so that he can empower you. Because guess what? You really can't do mission effectively without him. Can't do it. And so, and for those of you who have received the Holy Spirit, I don't want you sitting over here like, well, I've had the Holy Ghost for 25 years, son. <laughs> awesome. But if the power of God has not been demonstrated in your life, what's the purpose? Because that's what he gave us for. And so for some of you tonight that have been spirit-filled, man, that's awesome. I want you to even tap into what God is doing in your life and wants to do. And sometimes our well gets clogged. Remember what Jesus said in John that there's living waters that will flow through you, that flow through your innermost being? He was referencing to the Holy Spirit. And what he meant by that is, man, when you receive the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes to live in your life, it's going to be a rivers of water to just flow through you. And sometimes these rivers get backed up and polluted because life, sin, unforgiveness, bitterness, hatred, not spending time with Jesus, all these different things. And tonight, what we're going to do in our prayer time is we're going to help the Holy Spirit kind of get unclogged in you. You seasoned believers. I'm going to help you break through some more and, and get back to a place where you remember years ago that you were praying and operating in authority. Any of you remember when you were first baptized in the Holy Spirit? Okay, y'all scaring me up in here. Amen, 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 amen. And so what I want us to do tonight is I want us to get to a place saying, God, we're going to be living this year as a church, as a body, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, and we're going to start out by seeking him, seeking him. You know, I, I love this because I just want to give you a couple stories on this, and I'm going to be concluding my time. But um, I was at one church, and there was a youth leader. She was a young girl, maybe in her teens, you know, early 19, and she had never received the power of the Holy Spirit, and she was just like, I'm really nervous. Um, but I, I'm hungry. And I want to tell you, that's the first prerequisite is hunger. If you're not hungry, you won't eat. We got a hunger for God. We got a hunger for more of his presence in our life. So this young girl says, I'm really hungry to receive the Holy Spirit, but I'm nervous. And so I said, well, tell me what you've been taught about the Holy Spirit. And she told me, I said, that's all great. That's all right. I said, well, what's, what's your biggest hindrance from receiving him? She says, I just don't know if I'm going to be able to speak. Pray in tongues. I said, great, I got it. I said, that's not your biggest worry. I said, let me help you right now. Focus on Jesus. I said, I want you to worship Jesus because he's the baptizer. 
Jesus said, I will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. I said, I just want you to worship Jesus and just begin to thank him out of your own mouth because as you do that, you can't have a closed mouth and receive the Holy Spirit. It just can't happen. It's not just like you're going to be like, ah! like, that's not what he'll do a lot. I promise you. We have to respond to him. So I told her, I said, remember in the Bible that the Holy Spirit gives utterance? He gives you the ability to speak? And she said, yeah. I said, so you got to start out praying and seeking Jesus. And I said, don't beg him for the Holy Spirit. That's one of the mistakes I want to help us understand tonight. If you're seeking him to be baptized the first time, you're not going to beg him. Because he said, ask me. So ask once and then get ready to receive. And so I said, listen, I want you to ask Jesus right now to give you the Holy Spirit. So we prayed. And I said, right, great. I want you to begin to thank him for giving you the Holy Spirit. And as you begin to thank, the, thank Jesus, I just laid my hands on and I prayed for her. And I didn't have to, but it's biblical. It was a point of contact. I said, Holy Spirit, now just begin to fill her and allow her to pray in a new language that you give her so that she can have power from on high. And all of a sudden, this girl just fell, fell down. And I picked her up. I said, you okay? She said, yeah. She said, I just felt something on me. I said, Man, he, it's him, the Holy Spirit. I said, what'd you do? She said, nothing. I said, you got to do something. I said, Let me, let's pray again. I said, respond to him. And she says, how do I do that? I said, just speak what you hear him saying to you. Just begin to pray in the new language he gives you. Pray for her again. Next thing I know, boom, she just started praying in the Holy Spirit. This just flow. I was in Africa one time, an evangelist. The evangelist says, brother, I want to receive the Holy Spirit. It's my African voice. I said, you've never received the Holy Spirit? He said, no, brother. I said, okay, you want the Holy Spirit? I said, lift your hands. I said, ask him in your language. He started playing. Baba, it's Swahili. I said, okay. I just prayed for him. Laid my hands on him. And I backed up. And it was 30 seconds. He fell out on the floor. Boom. Praying in tongues. It wasn't me. I'm not anointed to make people fall. And what am I saying? I don't want you to get this theme that am I going to fall tonight if I receive the Holy Spirit? No. No. And let me just give you this disclaimer, church. If you haven't received the baptism in the Holy Spirit, you're not less spiritual than someone who has. Okay? And if you have, you're not more spiritual than someone who hasn't. No, no, no. It's just you're on a journey and you're waiting to get there as you seek Jesus. And so there's so many stories I can tell you on this, but tonight we're going to spend some time seeking him. The next thing I want to tell us to do is we're going to live under the power of the Holy Spirit. Guess what? We've got to spend time in prayer. Everybody say pray. pray. Come on, we got to spend time in prayer. Do we have prayer meetings here, Pastor Joe? Do we have prayer on certain times of the week? Not the whole church, but like on Wednesdays or something? Leadership prayer once a month. You know, you know, prayer meetings are the least attended meetings in churches. Isn't that crazy? But we want the power. That was this song that said, I got the power. Y'all remember that song? I remember that song. And it was interesting. Like, we want prayer. We want the power without the prayer. That doesn't make sense. My friend, prayer is the engine that advances the kingdom of heaven. Prayer is the engine. Listen, anything that has happened in this time, this era, this century, this last century, it was preceded by prayer. Any great awakening, any movement of God, I'm telling you, they prayed. There was a man named Daniel Nash when John Wesley would go out and do revivals. He prayed. He was under the boil. He was in boiler rooms at churches. Every time he would go to revival, Nash would take two or three people and pray for weeks before he got there. Fast and pray. And then while he was there, he would be praying while he was preaching to the masses. Prayer is a fuel to power. Prayer is a fuel to intimacy. Listen, when you don't have intimacy, you don't have power. Let me give you an example. I mean, my wife been married for seven years. Pastor Joe was telling us I think they've been married for 25 or something like that, 25 years. And I could just imagine anybody that's been married for some period of time, there's a level of intimacy that you have with your spouse. Even as a parent and a child, you have a level of intimacy, and that intimacy grows as you spend more time together. And so as you spend more time together, that actually gives you more authority in that relationship. Think about it like this in prayer. As we spend more time with God, we begin to tap into the authority that he has given us and who Jesus has allowed us to have. But if we're disconnected from God, we don't have an understanding of the authority and the intimacy that he wants to have with us. Therefore, we don't operate under his presence and power. 
And so, church, I want us to understand, men, when we pray, when we spend time in prayer, when we spend time with Jesus, when we spend time seeking the Holy Spirit and being filled with the Holy Spirit over and over again, as Ephesians 8, 5, 18 tells us, see, some of you tonight, you'll get baptized in the Holy Spirit for the first time. But there's many feelings. Continue to be filled daily, worship and prayer, praying in that spiritual language, praying in that spiritual language, singing in that spiritual language. We can continue to be filled with his presence, but that happens in prayer. Everybody say prayer. And I understand that life hits us sometimes. Man, we got schedules, we got kids, we got families, we got headaches, we got heartaches, and we go from this place to, we go from this place of being so busy to where it makes us dehydrated for Jesus. But we've got to stay thirsty for him. And when you're thirsty, man, you're going to go in the fridge. You're going to look for water. You're going to go to the grocery store. You're going to buy a Brita filter. You're going to buy water bottles. You're going to buy Kool-Aid, whatever you need to buy because you're thirsty. When we're thirsty for Jesus, guess what? We're going to spend time in prayer. We're thirsty for his presence. We're thirsty for his power. We're thirsty for him to show up. And I don't want us to be a church that only prays when we need something from God. Because he's not a genie. We don't rub him with prayer to get something. No, no, no. God wants to spend time with you. He wants to speak into your life. He wants to speak into your future. He wants to show you what your friends, who your friends are. He wants to show you who to talk to, who to minister to. Man, prayer is awesome. It gives us intimacy with Jesus. So I just want to tell you, we got to spend time in prayer. And Peter was a guy who spent time in prayer. In the upper room, they spent time in prayer. When they was getting ready to go to heal the man, the temple in Acts chapter 3, they spent time in prayer. When he was getting a vision from God to preach the gospel to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10, guess what he was doing? Praying on the rooftop. I mean, we can go on and on and on. Even Paul, when he met Lydia, they were on the way to prayer. When he, when he cast out the demon and the, and the lady who, who had this fortune teller spirit, he was on his way to prayer. You never see in the Bible in Acts as a historical picture of how we are to function as a church. You never see in Acts where there was something that happened miraculously that wasn't connected to prayer. It just didn't happen. So I want to encourage this church, pray. Let's get to praying. When pastor calls a prayer meeting, everybody, come on, show up. Everybody, let's, let's get behind this because I'm telling you, when you begin to pray as a church, man, you begin to pray for your community. You begin to pray for the nations. You begin to pray for the missionary. Prayer is the engine. You'll start hearing stories from missionaries and people in your community of something happened, something shifted in my life, something changed. I don't know what's going on, but something's, I know what's happening. We praying for you. Let me just give you the greatest example. When I was a kid, I grew up in the inner city, and it was this place called Centerville, Illinois. You ever heard of that? Centerville. Centerville, you got to check Centerville out. It was this old church called 4231 McCaslin. And they would have, I was a knucklehead kid in the back. I was, let me see, I got some stuff. I got some candy in my pocket. When they would be in there praying, I was throwing candy at the old, old, old mothers of the church. Boom, shut up. I was a bad kid. I was full of the devil. Thank God for his grace. But I was in the church and my mom and would bring us to these prayer meetings. And I would hear them in the back. I was in the back of the church. They would be in there. Mm-hmm. No worship music, no pads, no guitars. Mm-hmm. And they would start singing songs like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. they would sing, hum Amazing Grace. Mm-hmm. Then they would start singing. They would start singing. And then I would recognize they would start praying. God, we come into your presence today in the name of Jesus. We come into your presence today. Lord, we enter in with, into your courts with thanksgiving, into your gates with praise. Father, we thank you today. We give you glory today. We honor. And they would just be praising the Lord and thanking the Lord. And I know how it is. Some of us was like, okay, Will, that was the inner city as a black church. Everybody doesn't pray that way. I beg to differ. It's not that they pray that way. It's that when we pray, it's always an expression of what's in our heart that we're desperate for God to do because we know we can't do it. And whenever you're desperate, my friends, you're not quiet about it. You're not quiet. You need something. 
you're going to open your mouth. And so I would hear these old mothers pray. And then they would get to a point where they was beating the pews and they was snot coming out of their nose and spit coming out of their mouth. And, and then they would always keep the doors open, Pastor Joe. In the hood, the doors open in the church. But I wondered why. And I was a kid and I was, I was throwing that candy. And they would never be bothered by it. I think somehow they was praying for me, God, touch them now in Jesus' name. <laughs> but what happened was this. I would throw that candy, and once I would see them get to this level where they weren't in themselves anymore, they were praying beyond who they were. They had begun to touch heaven. I began to feel something as a kid. And I stopped throwing candy. And I would sit back in the bench like this. What is this? And I know what I begin to feel. Now, I begin to feel the glory of God coming to that little old church. And this is how I know it's the glory. Because I would see old crazy Larry come in there with crack cocaine in his pocket and throw it on the altar. I would see the drug dealer in the neighborhood come in there and lay his loaded 9 millimeter on the, on the altar and get on his knees and start praying and crying, oh! God. And these same people that I saw that was in the world that was full of the devil, full of trouble, hurting people, was the people that now became elders and deacons and preachers in the church. That was prayer. It was prayer, people. This is our source. I'm telling you, church, this is our engine, man. We're getting ready to go in here in just a moment. Spending time in prayer with Jesus is the most important thing to living under the influence. But we can't stop there. we got to spend time in the Word. I want to read this really quickly. Peter's first sermon, he preaches from the book of Joel. Now, I want to help you remember, church, he never had a Bible. He didn't have a Bible when he stood up. Pastor Joel would get up on Sundays with this nice iPad, and he's got the great TV, and that's awesome. He's got the Word, but Peter didn't have it. Where was it? In his spirit, man. It was in him. In the Old Testament, what happened was they would quote the Bible day after day after day as they walked for miles. And they would compete against each other to remember the Torah by memory. And let me give you this great story. There was a man named, uh, not Watchman, Watchman, no, not Watchman, the, uh, Brother Yoon, Brother Yoon. He's got a book called The Heavenly Man. If you haven't read it, read it. And this book about how he got captured by the Korean government because he was a Christian, him and his wife got captured. And what he decided to do when he was a young boy, his mother had got Save somehow the missionary or something snuck into China, got his mother saved, shared the gospel. Then his mother had led him to Jesus as a 16 year old young boy. They had no access to the Bible, so watch me. He says, I'm gonna pray and fast. He fasted for a period of up to 80 days, tells you how crazy the human body is. But then when he got his Bible, he said that he was going to purpose to remember the book of Psalms, the book of Proverbs by memory. When they captured him, guess what? Watching me, not watching me, but Brother Yoon didn't have a Bible. They took it from him. When they would torture him and put acid in his nails and in his toenails and do certain things to him, they wondered, what is this guy doing? He would be quoting and singing the Psalms by memory. It tells you how God's made the human mind. We limit what God can do to us, church. When we get in the word and we memorize it, I just want to read you Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 9 really quick. Let's read this. It says, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. But don't stop there. You must commit yourself wholeheartedly to these commands I am giving you today. This was Moses telling the children of Israel, read the word, read the Torah, be in it, live it. This is what he said. Listen to this. He says, Repeat them again and again to your children. Oh, will we get back to a place, church, children, when we can sit around our tables and stop spending only 30 minutes a week, as the national statistics tell us, as a family. But when we can start spending an hour each night with our kids and we can get around the table and quote the Bible and read the Bible and love the Bible and get that into our kids, because that's what they did at, as, as Israelites. That's what they did. Listen to what it says. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are home and when you're on the road. That's what that means. Talk about them when you're driving in your car, when you're going to pick up the kids, when you pick them up or drop them off. Talk about the word. Get the word in you. This is what they did. And then it goes on to say, 
Not only on the road, but when you're going to bed, when you get up in the morning, tie them on your hands, wear them on your forehead, write them on your doorpost. Listen, it says saturate yourself with the word. We need to get back to that place, church. Because there's going to be a time when we need that word like Jesus did in the wilderness. He didn't have the Bible, but the devil tempted him. And he pulled out the word. Every temptation he faced, man, don't live by bread alone. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. He had the word in him. Not only was he, had, not only was he the word, but he had the word in him. Church, we've got to spend time in the word. I want to give you this quick illustration here. How many of you got a bank account? Hey, man, some of you that don't, I'm praying for you. I'm just telling you. When you work, you expect to get paid, don't you? Yeah, you say, better get paid. When you get paid, most of us have a direct deposit, right? Right. Some of us are still old school. I get it. I'm with you. When the old Y2K movement, right? No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> some of us are still old school. We want paper. We want to take it to the bank. I get it. This direct deposit, I, I love this because this is actually how the Spirit works. So the Holy Spirit, he's the author of the Bible. He wrote it. He inspired writers to record it. But he's the author. So he is behind God's word. Jesus came to live God's word that he would show that he's God. But the Holy Spirit, he's like this. I love it. This is the word. When we deposit the word in our heart, when it's time, he'll withdraw it. But if we never deposit it, guess what? We can't even make a withdrawal. Insufficient funds. You ever been to the bank? And didn't have money in the bank. And they kept saying, ah, insufficient funds. I've been there. That's how some of us are when it comes to the word. We don't have enough word in us to when the Holy Spirit wants to draw it out of us, he can't because we haven't deposited it. So, church, I'm encouraging you, deposit this word in your heart. As David said, how can a young man stay pure? By hiding your word in my heart. How can a young man stay away from sin? By hiding your word in my heart. we got to spend time in the word. And last but not least, we got to spend time sharing with others. This is the whole premise of living under the influence of the Holy Spirit. This is why Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. That's why he sent the Holy Spirit. We've got to spend time sharing the good news with others. We already talked about it, the seed source. We got it. It's in us. Come on, keep reading that passage of Scripture in John or in, 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 in whatever I preach from on Sunday. Amen. Uh, keep reading it. I ain't going to try to fake it till I make it. I forgot. Uh, but keep reading it. Seed source. Go over that message. Hear it again. Get it in your spirit. My friends, we've got to seek the Holy Spirit. We've got to spend time in prayer. We've got to spend time in the Word. We've got to spend time witnessing with others. So this is what we're going to do for the rest of our time here. I'm right on time. Amen. That was kind of one of the longer messages, so forgive me for some of you that were like, we're done now with the message portion. This is my favorite part. We get to pray. How many of you are ready to pray? Come on. How many of you are nervous to pray? Be real. Yeah, yeah, come on. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, I see see you, sister. I'm with you. I'm with you. Amen. But this is the time we're going to pray. And so what I'm going to have you do is I'm going to give you this disclaimer. Come on, my keyboarders. Thank you, my sister. You're awesome, by the way. Um, What I want to get ready to have you do is some of you are here, and then I want to go back to the beginning. You need to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I'm telling you, you need to because... God has more in you and for you and wants to do through you, and you can't do it without the Holy Spirit. That's why I'm saying need. And so I don't want you to be afraid tonight. I'm going to pray specifically for some of you that would say, man, well, I have never received the Holy Spirit. I've never prayed in a new language. That's a little awkward to me. It's weird, brother. Great. I love it. Jesus can be weird sometimes. Some of you that have received the Holy Spirit, you're like, man, I pray in the Spirit. I love the Holy Spirit. I want to go deeper. Then for you, what we want to do is help you to begin to unclog some wells, help you to begin to hear the Holy Spirit tonight and some clarity, help him to begin to stir up some gifts that's within you. How many of you know there's gifts that the Holy Spirit has? There's gifts of wisdom, there's gifts of knowledge, there's gifts of prophecy, there's gifts of healing, there's gifts of faith. There's nine different gifts, 1 Corinthians 12. And the Holy Spirit, he's the author of those gifts. And so you can be in any setting, in church, in the marketplace, at school, and the Holy Spirit can say, do this. Go pray for that person. Go speak this to that person. And he does that because we're filled with his power and operating under the influence of who he is. 
And that's how the gospel's advanced, my friends. Well, you can go to somebody and they're like, how'd you know that? Like, I didn't, God did. I served Jesus. Can I tell you about him? That opens up the doors. But in order for the church to live on mission and live effectively, we've got to begin to operate under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And so we're going to get ready to pray now. And what I want us to do is just get ready to stand. Let's stand. Let's stand together. Let's stand together. And this is a time where I just want you to prepare your hearts because um, I, I love prayer, my friends. I I do. I've just seen God do so much to prayer. And it's a passion of mine to help the church. I learned how to pray from two people. One, I watched my grandmothers pray in the old church. And two, Africa. Oh, they can pray in Africa. They're desperate to experience God. And so tonight, I know many of you have prayer lives, and this is great. And so this is nothing but a continued exercise for you. But some of you, man, you've been struggling in your prayer life. It happens in seasons. And I, tonight, my goal is to help you break through in prayer. That's my goal. I want to help you touch heaven. There's, there's an element of prayer that we have to kind of get out of ourself. We have to get out of our own ways and fleshliness and thinking. And that's, that's when we begin to adore God and, and just forget about us. I'm going to walk you through this prayer model called Acts. You may have heard it before. Just adore Jesus, adore him, adore him, adore him, who he is, and love on him. And man, how many of you know when you just begin to love on Jesus, something happens in your heart, you begin to cry because you recognize where he took you from, who you used to be, who you're not, you, who you aren't anymore. You just begin to love on Jesus. And then we get to this point of, man, we just begin to confess whatever's in our heart, anything in our heart. Man, Lord, I tripped today, I flicked somebody off, I spoke, whatever. Just get whatever out of your heart. This is getting you out of yourself and it's helping you get into the presence of God. Because how many of you know, the Bible says, enter into his courts with praise, into his gates with thanksgiving. And so we've had to use this strategy to get into the presence of God. Isaiah saw the Lord and he says, holy, holy are you, O God. When we get a glimpse of who God is and his glory, nobody can stand in it. Tonight we want to ask the glory of God to come into this church and change some of us. Heal some of us, deliver some of us, help some of us. Whatever he needs to do, he knows it. But we're going to confess. And then we get to this point of thanking God. Thanking Jesus. I love to thank God. My wife would tell you, oh, brother, I love to thank Jesus. I thank Jesus for everything. Let me tell you how I thank Jesus. Jesus, I thank you for my shoes. I thank you for my drawers. I thank you for my socks. I thank you for my A shirt. I thank you for my hair. I thank you for my wife. I thank you for my car. I thank you for being able to walk, the activities of my limbs, my fingers, my eyes, for hot water, for cold water, for Roman noodles, for beef steak. I, th I thank you for everything. My friends, you know why we need to do that? Because none of it belongs to you. I thank you for the 401k, the 413b. I thank you for my kids. I thank you for my future kids. I'm going to thank you for everything. And when you begin to thank Jesus, something happens in you. You're like, oh, my gosh. You have done all of this. You have done it. And so we move from confession to thanksgiving, and then we move to supplication. And that's when you begin to ask. So you begin to ask him, God, bring healing. God, bring me a husband. God, bring me a wife. God, fill me with the Holy Spirit. God, whatever it is, heal my body. God, help me to do all the things you, that's on your heart. Supplication. Just begin to ask him. But I'm telling you, this is what's going to happen if we really participate tonight. I'm telling you, I've seen it thousands of people. Once we move, if we get into the adoration and we get to the confession and the thanksgiving is what shifts. Because this is what the Bible says. Give thanks in all things, for this is the will of God. So I don't want you to be afraid. You may be like, Will, I'm really quiet. Not for Jesus. Not for Jesus. Not for Jesus. If we can roar for the Chicago Bears and the Green Bay Packers and, 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 and laugh when, when we see stuff on Facebook, oh, my friends, we can get loud for Jesus. And I'm not saying get loud to exuberant to where you're not yourself. Get loud to the point where praise is coming out of your heart. That's what praise means. We've got to proclaim and praise him. There's some Greek words that I could teach you, but we've got to get that out of us. Because there's something powerful when sound comes. Remember the walls of Jericho came down? When the sound came, there's, there's a barrier that breaks when the plane begins to go into the sky. And he's got to break the sound barrier. Sometimes you hear it. 
something happens, that plane can fly more freely when it breaks the sound barrier. So tonight, we're going to move from acts, basically we're going to adore, confess, thanks, supplication. And some of you are here, let me just ask you to close your eyes right now, all over this place, we're getting ready to respond. The reason why I'm asking you to close your eyes, because I just want to see with my hands, with my eyes. If you're here tonight, with every eye closed, no shame, no guilt, if you're here tonight, and you say, Will, I have never been baptized in the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of praying in a new language, but tonight I want to. I just want you to lift your hand while every eye is closed. Count your hands. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. 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 You can put your hands down. That's awesome. Several people. Man, God's going to do it for you tonight as we seek him. He's going to do it for you tonight. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to get ready to respond in prayer. And I want you to forget about all the worries you have. Don't worry about work tomorrow. Jesus is going to give you supernatural strength. If the kids need to be picked up, bring them up here. They can get filled too in Jesus' name. But I want you to get the worries off your mind right now. I just want you to begin to focus on Jesus. And we're getting ready to respond at the altar. Holy Spirit, tonight, we need you to speak to us. We need you to help us to pray through. We need you to fill us. We need you to baptize us for the first time. We need you to stir up the gifts in us. And Lord, we're coming to you tonight because we're asking for your glory and your presence to come into this place. And one prerequisite, Lord, is to prepare our hearts. So even now, we're preparing our hearts that your glory would enter this temple, this presence. Thank you, Jesus. This is what I want you to do right now, my friends. If you're here, I want you to just step out of your seat and we're just going to create space at these altars and the aisles. We're just going to begin to create some space. And for those of you that raise your hand and say, Will, I want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, I'm just going to ask you to meet me over here as we all begin to move because I want to pray with you specifically. And so if you've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit, just meet me over here, but everybody else just begin to fill in in this place. So come on, just begin to get out of your seats and make way at the altar, and I'm going to get ready to walk you through this prayer portion. We're going to tap into God. We're going to tap into God. And I'm going to be over here with my friends to help you just break through. Come on, I'm excited for you guys. 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 Come on. Come on. Come on. This is just between us and the Lord. This is awesome. This is awesome. This is awesome.